the results. <clears throat> so on the multiple choice, uh, the average was 63.6 uh, points. Uh, that was an 85%, which is good in my book. That's an, an ideal uh, average for a test. Uh, means, and the, the maximum was 96%. Uh, one, one group got a 96, uh, which is great. That means that some people got it all the way, pretty much, and, uh, and then the, the min was 77 which is not that bad, uh, so nobody completely bombed it. So I, I, feel, I feel good about that. It means that I scaled the test properly, uh, difficult guys. And then on the essay, uh, the average was the same, essentially, 84. Uh, there was one person in the class that just crushed that essay uh, and, and then also got the bonus, of course, got those. But, um, and one, one person did uh, kind of poorly on the essay, but overall the uh, the grade distribution was, was really good. So top score in the class was at 94, and the bottom score overall in the test was a 70. The average. So I was I was happy with that. Hopefully you you guys are. Um, so the bonus questions first. Uh, let's let's do the easy stuff. What has been done well in this class? Um, people liked how I made the science accessible. Uh, I got a lot of feedback on the lab, which made me feel good because I put a lot of work into that lab, I'll tell you. Um, every hour of lab time takes me probably five outside of lab to get it all working. Um, so fun, interesting, useful. I'll try to uh, have it continue to be so. Um, the podcast, there's a lot of... Uh, Generally, positive feedback on the podcasts that were effective, way of communicating, interesting, easier than reading, because you could multitask, people cook or whatever while they're listening to it in school. Um, people, some uh, comments, putting good job putting the pieces together. Uh, PowerPoints are clear. I do put a lot of time into those, probably more than I should. Lecture uh, recordings are very useful. People like uh, that I record the lectures. I, I, I do think that's a great thing helps me and you guys. Well paced for level material, like how common ground can be in life, Mainer, from Mainer to science and course, and a good a mixture of lecture and discussion. Um, I would like to do a little more discussion, a little more activity, and less me blabbing at you, but uh, that, that stuff takes a lot of time to, to plan. Uh, and historical stories took lots of time, probably more time than they should have in the future. I'll, I'll have to cut that down a bit, but uh, they made the material easier to remember. There are a lot of, whenever I can, uh, I try to pull uh, interesting or weird stories out of the history because history's weird, man. History's weird. It's interesting. All right, the harder stuff. So what needs improvement? Um, I had um, a couple comments wanting uh, people wanting me to be clear about what will be tested, essentially, uh, and or being more explicit about what is important info and what is tangential info. Um, in general, uh, I, I do appreciate that, particularly in students that are super geared towards passing a test. Um, and so what, I would, what I'm going to try to do to, to, uh, to address that is at the end of each of my, I, I call them lectures, but they take obviously like a week or two for me to get through a single uh, series of PowerPoints. At the end of each of those lectures or whatever they're called units, um, I'm going to put uh, a summary. I'll try to make a summary slide that just hits uh, bullet points of what I, I think were the, the most important concepts um, so that you see that in a list format. Um, but I will say this to you, that is a skill you need to develop on your own too, learning how to pull that stuff out. Uh, and, and you're trying to know me, get to know who I am and what I think is important. But it's, it's a good skill to learn how to read an instructor like that. But I'll, I'll do what I can for you. So uh, more structure to the material. Um, yeah, I guess that is, that is true. It, it, was nice. it would be nice to have more structure to the material in terms of, like, oftentimes you take a class that's based on a textbook or something, and that is posed structure. There is no textbook for this class. It would be nice if there was one, but there isn't any out there on the market. So um, that is something I'm, I am aware of and I'm working on. I'm going to try to 
continue to, to give it a more cohesive, uh, better organized manner with time. That usually takes a couple years for a class to really dial into that. But it's something I'm aware of and trying. So kitchen it, slash lab is, is cramped. Uh, yeah, it's true. I wish there was something I can do. I've mentioned it. Uh, maybe they'll someday build us a nice, like, super fancy teaching kitchen like any reasonably well-funded uh, high school might have. I think Colby can do that. But I, I, I agree with that. Uh, transition was hard from the simple material to the more complex material. Um, I probably could have eased that by uh, rearranging some of the material, putting the Gen Chem stuff earlier on. And I will do that. It, it didn't really occur to me that you guys needed it until I got a few weeks into the class. So I, I will uh, try consideration, less examples per topic. Um, so that was kind of the, the, the one that was put forward, the foods from around the world. I need to reconsider that last time. I, I've already said that. I said that. Um, and real world applications of chemical concepts we learn. That's always important. We'll also try to be more alive to inserting those uh, in there. Uh, less PowerPoint, more activities in lecture. Uh, yeah, I've already said that I, I want that myself. Uh, history section was too lengthy. Agreed. Again, move Gen Chem review to begin. So I said that. Apple data collection seemed like busy work. Make purpose of lab more clear. That's, that's a good uh, point. Um, so I probably uh, do need to put a couple paragraphs in the beginning of that lab or maybe do a pre-lab introduction explaining the whole, the general purpose of that lab, the purpose of that lab being uh, that you are there just to collect data. Uh, the point of that was seeing how uh, reproducible a data set you can collect and then how can you graph that data and identify correlation in, in, a, in an easy way. We're just, we're cutting up apples. We're not doing anything super complicated. I cut up apples and uh, collect a bunch of data. The seeds uh, was a little bit of busy work, um, but I cut that out on the fly. It, the lab needs some, some work, and I, I'm going to work on that. Um, be more clear about due dates. That's a bullet point that I have already in my uh, thing. It, it is uh, a challenge the first time through a class when you're building it because I don't have all the material uh, throughout the, I don't have all the material built yet. The class isn't fully built yet. I'm only about a week ahead of you guys right now. Um, but uh, yeah, having the due dates uh, is is important and I'll make sure to try to be on top of that. Hard copies of notes for students to take notes on. Somebody had said that. Um, I am I'm loath to do that. The whole reason I use Moodle and I have to put the PDFs out there is because I'd rather not print out paper. I don't really like doing that. Um, I, like, I like to have it uh, digital. You guys all have access to printers. If you want hard copies, I do make the PowerPoints available. You can print them out. Personal belief that I have. So uh, more group problem solving. Um, yeah, I, I'm into that. I like that. I, that's a great way to learn. Um, and we are going to do some of that uh, either today or um, next lecture. I have, I have one of those. Those take time to build. They really do build those things. But uh, I, I, with time, we'll add many of that, as much of that as we can. So I hope I address those things. Uh, what topics do you still want to learn about? How does taste work? Uh, we're going to get to that, um, I, or at least I intend to. I want to talk about the, I'm going to have a couple lectures on the GI system from the mouth to the anus, uh, and taste will certainly play a, a role in that. Um, flavor, and so uh, flavors of different foods, um, and along the taste thing, there are some podcasts that are coming up that I think, uh, I don't remember who that was, but whoever made that comment, uh, there are some podcasts that, was that, was that you? No. Somebody asked about who, how taste works. I don't remember who that was, but um, there are some podcasts uh, coming up that you will probably enjoy. Uh, the flavors of different foods, that's the Maillard reaction. That's the, the last two labs uh, in the C series that I've planned. We'll address that, and we'll talk about my art and lab, so we'll get there. How does digestion, I've already said. Food allergies, um, I'm probably unlikely to have a chance to talk about that, but I'll see if I can fit it in. If I can, I will. Um, I, did, I did put in uh, that podcast uh, the, this last week about the alpha-galactose uh, sensitivities, and that, that falls roughly in that category. 
uh, someone wanted to learn more about nitrogen proteins, uh, how calorie content changes by cooking. Um, and so that's um, something we'll talk about when I talk about metabolism a little bit. Uh, making sourdough in lab. That's a great suggestion. I would love to do that. And next year, maybe I'll cut out the sauerkraut and make sourdough instead. But, well, I don't know if that's going to happen this year or not. <coughs> try. Making sourdough is pretty easy. Just mix water into flour. Maybe pour a little bit of pineapple juice in there and let it sit on the cloth over it, on the mantelpiece, for keep adding a little bit of flour every time. It gets frothy. Make your own sourdough. Um, learn about metabolism. Oh, you can bet you're going to get some metabolism out of me. Uh, foods that affect cellular respiration and muscle growth. Um, we will talk about that as we talk about anabolism in the metabolic. Industrial agriculture, herbicides, uh, pesticides, impacts on nutrition. We'll talk about that uh, a little bit, in, particularly in the GMO lecture, uh, because genetically modified organisms and herbicides, pesticides, go hand in hand. That's GMO is how you use pesticides. Resistant plant plants that are resistant to those herbicides and pesticides and spray it on and everything else dies. So we will talk about that. Or you're going to get to debate it. That's the end of the semester. Uh, chemistry and chemical changes behind cooking, baking, food processing, that's coming. Uh, science behind nutritional controversies, eggs or soy, uh, for example, or not for example. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll see if I can throw a tangent in there to satisfy that person. Um, nutritional controversies, that was one of the, like, podcast topics, themes that I was thinking about. Um, how to make healthy food choices on campus and at Colby. There's definitely going to be uh, a couple podcasts uh, that kind of relate to that in the super. So uh, we will talk about that a bit. I'll talk about uh, nutrition uh, broadly. Uh, we'll talk about how to make choices. On campus. So that's a great. I hope I addressed everybody's concerns. I want to, you guys, I, I see our, ourselves as a team trying to make this class a really cool class. You can say you were the inaugural class that took this class and helped make it um, a good class. I really want it to be good. Um, so thank you for your feedback. I'll try to, to listen to you. All right, on to some carbohydrate chemistry. Um, so this guy, Sir Walter Norman Hayworth, uh, I wish I had an interesting story about this guy. There must be one, but, uh, you know, sadly, a lot of the history of, uh, of science, uh, in general and food science in particular, it's kind of hidden. It's kind of hidden. Uh, if anyone is really interested in the topic of, uh, food science, and you're also interested in writing, creative writing, whatever. It's like you could have with the foodie culture that we live in right now. You could slam dunk a New York Times bestseller just uh, going back through the history of all kinds of different things and finding the colorful characters and actually exposing their interesting stories because uh, there's a lot of them out there. I I'm likely to have the time to write that book, but um, so I'm not going to be able to give you much on this guy, except the fact that uh, he won the Nobel Prize in 1937. He had an otherwise uh, normal-sounding, remarkable life. Um, and uh, he did a lot. He did a lot uh, to advance carbohydrate chemistry in particular. Um, he unambiguously identified the three-dimensional structure of uh, maltose, which is the disaccharide subunit of amylose, uh, plant starch. Uh, and, uh, he also identified unambiguously the, the uh, 3D structure of cellobios, which is the disaccharide subunit of cellulose, and a bunch of the hemicelluloses and pectin, and, uh, and like cellobios is a part of a lot of the polysaccharides uh, we're going to talk about in a couple days. Uh, he also identified the structure of lactose, uh, the disaccharide that is mother's milk. Um, and allolactose, which is uh, a sugar I'll talk about a little bit, little bit later because it actually relates directly to some research I did in graduate school. Uh, for all of his work, uh, he received the Nobel Prize in 37 uh, for his investigations in carbohydrates 
And uh, he also is the one that identified the structure of vitamin C, uh, which is an extremely important uh, metabolic intermediate in the tricarboxylic acid cycle, which we'll talk about in metabolism. And uh, we'll talk about it on Friday when we talk about uh, how pectin works and how jellies are made. One of the things that he uh, gave us was uh, what's called the Hayworth projection. And it's another way to write carbohydrates. Up until this point, we've been using the Fisher projection, right? The linear carbohydrate chain. Uh, it turns out that the linear carbohydrate chains, linear carbohydrates can form rings. They can form rings. They can cyclize, uh, self-cyclize, and form what's called a hemiacetal. We'll see that in a slide or two. Um, but uh, this Hayworth projection... Uh, shows the stereochemistry of all of the chiral centers in the ring uh, and gives us a sense of the three-dimensionality of the ring. So you can see here this skeletal structure of the six carbons uh, in the backbone, and then uh, there is this hemiacetal that gets formed. We'll see what that even means uh, in another slide. But uh, one of the members of the six-membered uh, ring is an oxygen that forms uh, what looks like uh, an ether uh, linkage there. Um, and then one of the methyl groups is sticking out. If a, a hydroxyl group is pointing up from one of those carbons, it is above the plane of the ring. And if it's sticking down, it's simply below the plane of the ring. All right? So that's uh, the, the Hayworth projection. And you can see on, uh, in that little GIF I have embedded there, the transition from a linear Fisher projection to uh, a Hayworth projection. All right. So I've used these terms uh, just now. I'm going to define them for you. Hemiacetal and hemiketal. Uh, um, so in at the end of these carbohydrate chains, you have uh, the ones that I've shown you so far, like the open chain form of glucose, there is uh, an aldehyde uh, on, that, on that carbon. So that aldehyde on one end of the carbon uh, chain is able to react with an alcohol. Aldehydes react with alcohol. So an aldehyde is a carbon double bond O. All right, and you see the aldehyde functionality uh, to the right on the top. Um, it's a carbon double bond O, and then it has a carbon chain sticking off of it, and uh, the other substituent to the carbon is hydrogen. Right? Aldehydes are related to ketones, uh, except that that carbon uh, that has the double bond O to it, uh, attached to it, is attached to two carbons, rather than at the end of a carbon chain. It's in the, somewhere in the middle of a carbon chain. That's the difference between an <coughs> aldehyde and a ketone. They're, otherwise, they're identical. So aldehydes and ketones, that uh, C double bond O, that, they react uh, with alcohol uh, to form um, a, a hemiacetal, uh, if it's a reaction with an aldehyde, or a hemiketal, if it is a reaction with a ketone. All right? So if you see on the right-hand side, you have the carbonyl group of the aldehyde or ketone, and the alcohol, um, and that uh, the hydrogen transfers itself to the oxygen of the carbonyl, and then that one of the bonds between the oxygen and the carbon just switches to the other oxygen. So when we look at uh, the, the carbon on the right-hand side of the hemiacetal or the hemiketal, you'll notice that its oxidation state didn't change. It had, it's bonded to the same number, has the same number of bonds to oxygen. So in the carbonyl group, it's bonded to two. Uh, no, I'm sorry. It's bonded to one oxygen, but it has two bonds to an oxygen. And in the hemiacetal or hemiketal, the carbon has two bonds uh, to an oxygen. It just turns out that they're different oxygen. Okay? Um, whereas the carbon on the left-hand side still has only one bond to, to an oxygen. It is this reaction, it is this uh, reaction that you see here that is the, uh, the formation of a ring, a sugar ring. 
right? And this, this reaction is in equilibrium. So sugar rings form and they unform. They form and they unform. As long as that hydroxyl group in the hemiacetal or hemiketal stays a hydroxyl group. If that oxygen, in, the hydrogen, pardon me, the hydroxyl group in the hemiacetal or the hemiketal, if that hydrogen comes off and that oxygen binds to some other carbon in another sugar, forms what's called a glycosidic linkage, which is a chain, the rings can no longer open and close. Okay, it needs to have that hydrogen on there to be in equilibrium to open and close as a ring. All right, that's what we call a reducing sugar. When it has that hydroxyl group, that hemiketal or hemiacetal is reducing. That means it can open and close. All right, so uh, let's number the carbons. Now that we've identified the primary carbon of the hemiacetal and hemiketal, uh, we're going to number them using this Hayworth projection. Number one, number one. And if the sugar is a hexose, what does it mean to be a hexose? Six carbons. If it's a, uh, if it's uh, a carb, six carbon hexose, then you just walk along the carbon chain. You don't walk across the oxygen bridge. You walk along the carbon chain. Uh, so starting at the the carbon that has that has two bonds to oxygen. That's always uh, in a, in the aldose. Uh, or a, a sugar that has an aldehyde at the end, that's going to be carbon one. Okay? Um, what else should I say about this? That's it. So I've identified the hemiacetal functionality there, and you basically number around that. You don't go across them. Uh, okay. So <clears throat> I've already said this, but uh, and you've seen it, um, but... Again, to, to uh, reinforce, monosaccharides are in this constant equilibrium between an open chain, like free sugars in solution, reducing sugars, like glucose. You have like a, a solution of glucose or the glucose in your bloodstream, for example, the glucose that uh, is circulating around your body. That glucose is in constant equilibrium with open and closed, uh, open and closed forms. If so, in that top row there, you have we have a picture of glucose, uh, and on the left hand side, it's in a ring. If that ring has six members, six members to it, uh, then we call it a pyranose. Uh, pyrin, p y r a n is a six-membered ring where one of them is an oxygen. Okay, so if, it ha if the sugar a is a six-membered ring, then we call it a pyranose. Uh, and glucose is a pyranose. Um, in general, if that sugar uh, had an aldehyde on the end, it's called an aldose. I've already said that, um, but you see the picture of an aldose. Uh, on the bottom row, we have a picture of Fructose. So uh, glucose and fructose together form a disaccharide that is sucrose, white table sugar. So fructose um, is a ketose. It has a ketone. The double bond O is not on the end of the carbon chain. It's actually on carbon two. On carbon two. Fructose, when it cyclizes, it likes to form what is called a furanose. Uh, furan. F-U-R-A-N is a five-membered ring with one of the uh, members being an oxygen. So uh, fructose uh, goes from an open chain ketose to a cyclized uh, furanose. Um, and you can see on the little uh, white box on the right-hand side uh, depicting a ketose, instead of having uh, a hydrogen either sticking up or down, uh, from the uh, carbon that has the hydroxyl on it. It has uh, another carbon. Are there any questions uh, about any of this? This is just like slogging through the definitions of the chemical definitions that we're going to need. We're getting our vocabulary together so we can talk about some sugars. I want to talk about uh, fiber, for example. I can't talk about fiber without you knowing what these sugars uh, kind of look like.
So <clears throat> these uh, sugars are three-dimensional structures, right? Um, and so, for example, here is an uh, open chain of D-glucose. I should make this closed here. Uh, let's get Here's, here's galactose. You know, it's a, it's a three-dimensional structure. This, it's a, this is in the Pirano form. It's got a six-membered ring, right? There's this three-dimensional structure. How do I depict that on a two-dimensional plane? Well, there, here's four ways to do it. You can, have, you can depict a cyclized uh, ring with a fissure, a fissure projection. Instead of having the aldehyde on the end, you just draw a big loop around it so you can see uh, the, the closed ring form in the, in the fissure projection. Um, there is something called a Mills projection that you see quite often. It's as if you were looking straight down on top of the, the sugar, like right down the axis of the ring. Uh, that's what the Mills projection is. And the, the solid triangles are, uh, are groups that are pointing up, and the dotted ones are groups that are pointing away from the plane. Um, and then there's the Hayworth projection we just showed you. Another way to do the Hayworth projection that's quite common is this chair uh, conformation. So um, when you look at this uh, molecule from the side, you'll notice that it kind of, if you were to look at it uh, at an angle like this and just look at the carbon backbone of the ring, it kind of looks a little bit like uh, a mid-century modern chair from uh, the 50s or something like that. It's a, some sort of modernist chair. Uh, and they call this, and so because of that, they call this the chair conformation. All right? And we, you can depict chair com conformation that way. The way to interpret the chair conformation, uh, any of, any of the substituents or the, the things that are hanging off it that uh, are uh, at a gentle angle are equatorial. So if you think about the plane of the ring, anything that's in that uh, equatorial range uh, is going to be depicted in uh, beta glucose here. They're all equatorial there. Um, however, if you look in the box above it, that's alpha uh, glucose that has this hydroxyl switched and sticking down here. This would be axial, so this is the axis of the ring. Anything sticking up or down parallel to the axis of that ring, uh, those are axial substituents. Um, and, and the relative inversion of the stereochemistry between axial and equatorial of any of these hydroxyl groups is what uh, is going to change whether it's, uh, for example, this is galactose. If this was glucose, so galactose is uh, the sugar that is in a big long chain that makes pectin, which we make jellies out of. We'll do it on Friday. Um, glucose, like the stuff that's in your blood, uh, has this uh, axial hydroxyl is equatorial uh, right here. So if you look on the sugar, maybe I'll just use the arrow. Uh, this is carbon four, carbon one, two, three, four. Carbon four in glucose is equatorial. If this was galactose, it would be pointing up this way, just like this. So you guys get that? We're going to have a little bit of an activity uh, so you can, you can appreciate that. All right. Those are different ways to depict the same molecule. Here are some, a little bit about glucose. I'm not going to go in-depth uh, with all of the sugars we talk about their history, but I talk about glucose because it kind of is the most important biomolecule on earth. Uh, without a doubt, it is the most common biomolecule. There's more glucose on earth than any other, or gluco ring as part of cellulose, for example, than any other uh, biomonomer on, on earth. So we'll talk about it a little bit. Um, these are the glucose guys. Uh, so... <clears throat> Uh, first is this Andreas uh, Margraf, uh, who was a German that lived in the 18th century. Um, he did a number of things. Uh, first of all, he improved on uh, Hennig Brandt's uh, famous way of extracting phosphorus from urine. Uh, he used lead chloride or horn lead uh, to get it out. Um, 
of the urine. He also isolated zinc. Um, but importantly, in, 19, in 1747, uh, he was the first to isolate glucose as a syrup from raisins. Pure glucose syrup uh, was extracted from raisins. He also, uh, very importantly, was the first to isolate sucrose from sugar beets. Um, so, uh, this, this process of isolating sucrose from beets was taken by um, a, a colleague of his, or sort of like a, a lab assistant of his, and then industrialized. Uh, he, this Margraf did make a lot of money off of it, but it became this immense, <clears throat> enormous uh, cash crop, um, which uh, was important because up until this time, uh, sugar uh, was extracted from sugar cane, and uh, the extraction of sugar from sugar cane is uh, an industrial food process that led to untold uh, suffering, misery, and, and the, um, was perpetuated by the evil of slavery. So there's a huge, the, a huge industry uh, around the extraction of sugar from sugar cane was one of the, the primary uh, initial driving forces behind uh, the West Indian slave trade. Um, but when this guy was able to get sucrose out of beets, that was one of the things that made uh, West Indian slave trade begin to collapse. So that was uh, an interesting uh, and important chemical advancement milestone. This guy, uh, Jean Damas, he's the one that actually first uh, came up with the name glucose from the Greek, uh, glycos, uh, which means sugar uh, or sweet. And that is in reference to the must that's uh, extracted from uh, the sweet first press of uh, grapes in the making of wine. Um, and then Emil Fischer took uh, glucose and chemically synthesized it uh, out of... Um, I think it was glyceraldehyde. I think he did it either out of glyceraldehyde and glycerol or two glyceraldehyde molecules, or it may have been just out of glycerol. It was one of the, some combination of those three carbon uh, compounds. He was able to chemically synthesize uh, glucose for the first time. I've talked about uh, Emil Fischer before, of course. Uh, I, I find him to be a really interesting uh, character. He is, yeah, he is my academic great great grand going up the academic tree. Anyways, he identified uh, also the structure of glucose. All right. Um, the concept of an anomer, anomer, an anomer. So if we, we call it an anomer, uh, so what is a misnomer? What is a misnomer? Yeah, Christian. Yeah, something that's incorrectly <coughs> named. Incorrectly named. So something that is, uh, what is, it? can you guess what an anomer might mean? What the name might mean? Like, don't look at the definition, because that's not going to help you. Well, I said a misnomer. You said a misnomer was something that's incorrectly named, um, and uh, someone that is, for example, asexual has no no sex, no gender, right? Um, so, what would an a anomer mean? What? No name. Okay. So, <clears throat> um, the concept of an anomer. If we change the stereochemistry. Uh, about any chiral carbon in a sugar, we are going to change the identity of that sugar from glucose to galactose. For example, if I were to change uh, the stereochemistry about C4, right? If I change the stereochemistry here, it goes from glucose to being galactose. We had a name change. Uh, if I change the uh, stereochemistry about C3, I'm going to go from glucose to allose. If I change C2, it's going to go from glucose to uh, mannose, for example. 
if I change the stereochemistry about C1, glucose stays glucose. It, the stereochemistry there doesn't lead to a change in the name of the sugar. Okay? What, the way we designate it is alpha versus beta. Alpha glucose versus beta glucose, or alpha fructose, or alpha mannose, or galactose, or any of them. Alpha refers to when the hydroxyl group is axial, A for axial. Alpha is uh, axial, along the axis of the ring, and beta is when it's equatorial, all right? So <clears throat> glucose, that is reducing a reducing sugar, like just open chain glucose, that is floating around, it can form alpha or beta glucose when it cyclizes. It can form alpha or beta. And in fact, they are in equilibrium with one another. Uh, that equilibrium in solution has 36% of the sugar is alpha, and 64% of it is beta. Can anyone guess why that might be? So I have this number up here uh, for 36% of the glucose uh, that's in a ring in solution is alpha glucose. That has that, uh, has that hydroxyl group, the C1 hydroxyl, is pointing down equator uh, axially. And 64%, uh, roughly two-thirds of it, is in beta uh, in, in the equatorial plane. So while you're thinking about that, I'll go back here and show you this picture. So here on the right-hand side on the bottom, we have a beta glucose, and then the box above it, we have an alpha, all right? What do you notice about beta glucose in terms of the hydroxyl groups? Is there a mix of axial and equatorial? Are they all axial? Are you guys having a hard time visualizing what axial and equatorial means? They're all equatorial in beta. And indeed, glucose is the most common of the hexoses. Galactose is less so. You're holding galactose there. You see how there's a single uh, hydroxyl group that's axial sticking out the top of the plane there? That's one. That's it. Yep. Yep. So imagine this sugar ring is kind of spinning and tumbling through space. All right. And uh, imagine I'm a sugar ring and I'm like my body is a ring. This is the plane of the ring. And I'm going to spin around like this. As I spin around, my hands are up. But as I spin, my hands want to kind of fly out because of centripetal force. Okay? The, when you have more axial substituents, like larger axial substituents, um, you know, so you have hydrogen versus an oxygen, the, the, those oxygen are going to want to like ring flip out. They're going to want to like swing outwards, and it's going to deform that ring. So in beta glucose, there's no problem. They're all already equatorial. But in alpha glucose, uh, it, the ring is a little bit less stable. The ring is a little bit less stable. Galactose is intrinsically less stable already because it already automatically from the beginning has one that's axial. Um, and then when you look at the, the hexose tree, the he uh, there are the hexoses, like mannose or allose or altrose, these are really more rare sugars. It's because they're more unstable. Their structure is more unstable. All right? They have more of these axial substituents uh, than the equatorial ones. All right. So that's why we have less alpha glucose than beta glucose uh, in solution. It's just structurally less energetically favored. All right? because there's a battle between the one axial substituent and all of the other equatorial ones. Is that making sense? Did I lose anybody? Are, 
are people thinking about the depths of structural diversity in carbohydrates? Okay, here. so how much time we got left? Five minutes. Uh, is five minutes enough to do this? I think it is. Let's do it.